What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Lights Out Podcast. When Patty Donovan was a teenager in 1974, she had a few friends. Since her social life was so limited, she began searching for new connections. She struggled to communicate with the living. So you know what? Why not try her luck with communicating with the dead? It's an invitation for spirits to come into your life. When she was 19, she picked up her first Ouija board. This family was crucified, I have to say crucified. They can even set fires or hurl massive objects with incredible force. The fridge would move to the middle of the kitchen on its own. What's going on in here? Lorraine later claimed that she could sense a paranormal presence so powerful inside the house that it took all of her energy not to leave immediately. So this is the case of the Donovan poltergeist. Straight from Ed and Lorraine Warren's files. Light out, everybody. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Lights Out podcast. I'm your host, Josh. In the studio, I'm joined by Austin, my co-host. Yo. What's up, man? And we got the producer, Daniel, over there. What's up, man? What's up? How's it going, everybody? So before we get into today's episode, which is another one from the Warren Files, which we are coming close to the end of all the Warren Files that we could possibly cover, I feel like. Yeah, I, I don't even much. know what we're up to. I think we're 10 plus at this point. Yeah. But today we're going to be covering the Donovan Poltergeist case, which is a very interesting one. But before we dive into that, I want to talk a little bit about our own haunting we have going on here in the Lights Out studio. So a lot of things have been happening here and they haven't been good. We'll just put it that way. So last week, we sit down to record our episode on the Moore's murders. We record the whole episode and... You know, just like normal, nothing in here changes. So, like, we record an episode in here, and virtually everything stays the same as far as the the tech goes. And then we come back the following week and record an episode. So, we record this episode on the Moore's murders. Then, right after, Daniel goes to start editing it, and he's like, he calls me. He's like, "Hey, man, I hate to be the bearer of bad news." Which I liked your you liked your take on that. You really tried (laughs) to let me down easy with it. Like, hey, so there's no audio on this which obviously this is a podcast and the one thing we need is the audio and we have backups on backups too. nothing recorded at all, which is weird because why Daniel, because I double checked everything and I tested everything and we were perfectly fine. I didn't have any issues, but once we were done recording, which that's his job, right? His job is to make sure that everything's being recorded And he's watching things in Logic, which is our audio um, recording software that we use. And basically, you can see waves, you know, going up whenever we speak into the microphones. And that was all working, right? Or it seemed like it was working. It was all working. Yeah. And then there is no reason for our other system to not be working either, which syncs the audio with, with our actual video recording. And so I'm sitting there scratching my head. I'm like, what is going on? And we always kind of attribute some of the issues to the the building that we're in because we're kind of in an older office park and sometimes there's like power outages over the weekend. But I'm like, it's not every weekend that there's a power outage. Like what kind of unstable power grid is this over here? So it was very weird that we had nothing recorded. So we ended up having to redo that whole episode, but it was absolutely unexplainable for why nothing got recorded. It just doesn't make any sense. We still haven't been able to figure out. But the other really weird thing is when we lock up, we have a security or alarm system here at our office. And for the past month or two, alarms just go off randomly. And so I'll log in because I'll get notified, hey, the alarm at your office is going off, which would mean somebody came in, didn't turn the alarm off. And I go and check. It's like 3 a.m. Everything's dark. You know, the only people that come in late at night is like the people that clean our office. And that's only once a week. And these alarms are going off on days that they weren't coming in. So I'm like, what is going on? And I couldn't figure out what actual motion sensor was getting triggered for the alarm to go off. And so we had the alarm company come out and it turns out, (laughs) I just was like, I couldn't help but chuckle a little bit when I found out that it was the actual motion sensor that's literally right outside of this studio right here. And it's 
This one, this is the only one in the whole office that goes off randomly. So I'm thinking, what's going on in here? And, and I, I think I need to get like a camera running in here 24 yeah. seven because I'm starting to think I'm going to pick something up in here because weird things just happen in here. Like all of our tech goes haywire sometimes our alarms going off out here and it's just, it's really un, unexplainable because we double check everything. I mean, we had the episode a couple weeks ago where my mic distorted. Yep. I didn't touch anything on it and I haven't had an issue with it since I recorded last week. No issues. And we'll see. And it's always during the paranormal, the ones, paranormal yeah. ones where shit goes crazy. So we'll see what happens today. But, I thought Daniel was screwing with me when he came in. He was like, Hey, I got some really bad news. Daniel and I, screw around a lot and joke with each other <laughs> and so when he said he's like there's no audio i was like oh hilarious funny good uh, one yeah <laughs> good one but yeah some weird stuff's going on in here very weird which <laughs> it's always funny to see some of your reactions out there because you're like you guys need to you know sage the studio which which i'm planning to do that i've totally forgot to do it today before today's episode but i think we're gonna have to just start doing like a weekly cleansing in here yeah um so there's something going on in here. It doesn't make any sense because we don't have any of these issues. All of our setups are the same for our other shows that we, re we record in the other studios out here. And we never have any of these issues. It's always just in here. So is it just a coincidence or is our studio haunted? I kind of tend to think it's haunted because it was haunted in the last studio and now in this studio. Same shit, different day. But with that being said, Let's get into another haunting potentially caused by a poltergeist that we believe was brought through via a Ouija board. So this is the case of the Donovan poltergeist straight from Ed and Lorraine Warren's files. Today I want to thank a longtime sponsor of Lights Out, and that is none other than HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. I'm a huge fan of HelloFresh. Actually, I've been using HelloFresh for years. I actually pay for my own subscription, and I get four meals a week for my family. And what's great about it is it saves me so much time. First off, I don't have to go to the grocery store anymore, which I feel like every time I've gone to the grocery store, I'll go for a few items and I end up being there for like an hour. There's lines. Not only that, in the past when I've cooked my meals from the grocery store, I end up making way too much food and a lot of it ends up sitting in my fridge where it then goes moldy and then ends up in the trash. Just a complete waste of money. HelloFresh also gets that you want options when it comes to what to make for dinner, not just the same old thing all the time. That's why they offer 40 recipes to choose from every single week so you'll never get bored and you can always find something new to try. There's usually one night per week in my schedule where I need a quick dinner and instead of calling on delivery, HelloFresh has got me covered there as well with their fast and fresh recipes, which are ready in just 15 minutes or less. Plus, HelloFresh is 25% cheaper than takeout. So save your money, cook better meals, which are better for you with HelloFresh today. Go to HelloFresh.com slash LightsOut50 and use code LightsOut50 for 50% off plus free shipping. Go to HelloFresh.com slash LightsOut50 and use code LightsOut50 for 50% off plus free shipping. In 1974, West Hartford, Connecticut, it was a haven for middle-class families. New shopping malls, houses, and schools filled the blocks. New families were searching for peace and tranquility in the modern suburbs, and they flocked to new subdivisions. But not everything in West Hartford was at peace. Paranormal experts Ed and Lorraine Warren would later claim that this town was home to one of the scariest encounters they had ever experienced in their 50-year career. When Patty Donovan was a teenager in 1974, she had a few friends, and her parents Ted and Ellen kept a tight leash on her and her brother Brian. Since her social life was so limited, she began searching for new connections. She struggled to communicate with the living, so you know what? Why not try her luck with communicating with the dead? When she was 19, she picked up her first Ouija board. She lit a few candles and dimmed the lights, and she moved the planchette, spelling out the question, is anybody there? With those words, Patty sent out an open invitation to the other side. The planchette quickly shifted to yes, and from that moment on, 
the Ouija board became her main social outlet. For the next few weeks, she would hide away in her room and hold hour-long conversations with a mysterious entity. From what she could understand, she believed she was talking to the spirit of a teenage boy. He told her he had tragically died when he was young, and he never got to experience all the things of life. In the afterlife, he was incredibly lonely, just like Patty. And so the two of them bonded over their loneliness. He would even flirt with Patty, calling her the most beautiful girl in the world, prettier than all the other girls. This spirit seemed to play into her vanities and tell her everything she ever wanted to hear. She thought the spirit genuinely liked her, and since she was so desperate for social connection, it never crossed her mind that this spirit could be deceiving her or pulling the wool over her eyes. He even promised that one day he would marry her. Without even questioning how that would be possible, Patty took it as the greatest compliment and she began sharing her deepest secrets with the spirit. After their unusual love developed, Patty became curious about how much the spirit knew. She thought it could access untapped knowledge in the living realm. So in February of 1974, she asked the spirit what her future held, and the planchette spelled out, by 1978, you will bear three children. It even gave the exact birth date of her first child, by March of 1974, she felt like her and the spirit had developed a deep connection, but she realized she still didn't even know the name of this entity. Every time she asked, it always made up excuses and avoided revealing its true identity. No matter how much she pressured the spirit, it refused to reveal its name. Then one night, she demanded the spirit to show itself, but the entity moved the planchette to goodbye. The more she pressured the entity, the more it ignored her and the more angry it got. Patty's curiosity would soon awaken 60 days of pure terror inside of the Donovan household. On March 3rd, the morning after, Patty pressured the spirit to reveal itself. Her father's car wouldn't start. Ted lifted the hood to look for a problem and he noticed that the spark plugs had been tinkered with. A rubber hose had been unfastened and the fan belt had been cut. When he decided to borrow Patty's car instead, he realized her car also wouldn't start. So he got them both towed to a local repair shop. The technician said that both engines had been partially disassembled. Soon, Ted began noticing the shrubs in the front lawn were pulled away from their roots and scattered across the lawn and walkway. And later in the day, the whole family began hearing soft pounding noises on the exterior walls of the house. Pressure valves in the radiators would come loose. The cast iron plumbing vent pipe on the roof was somehow bent 90 degrees, and the front doorbell was disassembled. Ted tried to find any rational explanation. For the strange events. He even blamed his kids, but they weren't home when most household objects broke. And after he repaired the radiators and reassembled the doorbell, he would find them broken again only a few hours later. Even when he hired a few technicians to come to the house, they had the same problems. The radiator repairman admitted he could also hear pounding coming through the walls. As for the cars, they were soon repaired, but it seemed that nothing at the house was repaired for very long. Patty then got a flat tire on March 8th, and right after that flat tire was repaired, she got another one. The tires looked like they had been slashed with a knife. The family's first guess was that, you know, there's some neighborhood kids going around vandalizing their property. They even got Patty's car brand new tires and locked it in the garage. But even then, they kept finding her tires slashed. The next morning, Patty overheard her parents interrogating her brother Brian out in the front yard. One of the car tires had been slashed yet again. This now made it six times in the past couple of weeks, and they accused Brian and his friends of having something to do with it. But Brian swore he didn't know what was going on and stormed back inside before barricading himself in his bedroom. Moments later, the family heard a loud bang come from inside the home. As they ran to investigate the noise, they found a large 18-inch hole in the drywall. It was in the hallway right near Brian's room. They figured he must have just gotten angry and punched the wall, but they noticed the jagged edges of the hole faced outward, meaning that whatever damaged the wall might have actually come from inside it. Brian denied any involvement, and later that night the family heard scratching noises coming from inside of the walls of the house. Every few hours or so they heard muffled scratching and pounding. It sounded like some sort of infestation had gone inside. Maybe it was roaches or mice. 
which is what the Donovan family wanted to believe at first. On another morning, Patty's mother Ellen went to the bathroom to wash her face, just like she did every morning. But as she turned on the faucet, a red substance that looked like blood began to drip out. She figured it was a plumbing issue, but the same problem kept happening on and off for the next few days. A few nights later, the family was sitting in the main bedroom watching TV around 10 p.m. when all the lights flickered three times, and then the TV switched off. Again, Ted tried to find a reasonable explanation. In his eyes, the tire slashing was from the neighborhood kids. The blood-like substance in the faucet was a plumbing issue. The noises and damage to the walls were from an infestation. And now he figured the home had some electrical problems as well. But moments after the TV shut off, it would become obvious that this family's misfortune had no rational explanation. As they sat in the dark room, a six-foot-long, 250-pound dresser levitated off the ground. For a moment, it swayed back and forth in the air, twisting and turning before crashing down to the floor, nearly shattering the floorboards beneath it. And this was the first time the Donovan family confronted something they couldn't rationally explain. Then the bedroom doors opened and slammed shut while the family sat in horror. A chair lifted off the ground and scattered a pile of clothes before also crashing back to the floor. Moments later, the shriek of a kitten cried out, and the sound transformed into an infant crying, even though there were no babies in the home. When the family considered going to check out the noise, the family photos were lifted from the walls, flew in circles around the room, and then smashed on the ground. So they all huddled in fear, trying to shield themselves from the flying debris. When things finally calmed down, Patty raced to her bedroom closet and pulled out her Ouija board. While out of eye shot from the rest of her family, she tried reaching out to the spirit, but the other side was mostly silent. The planche had only shifted to goodbye. Her connection to the other side was now cut off, and the family would have to navigate through this terror alone. To protect his family, Ted began taking a few days off of work to stay home, and the paranormal activity only got stranger from then on. By now, our paranormal enthusiast listeners are probably thinking we're dealing with a poltergeist, um, which would be a solid guess. We'll see a little bit later that there might be a little bit more going on in this story. But for those who don't know, uh, poltergeist comes from the German word meaning poltern, which means to make noise or rumble, and geist, which means spirit. Some of the earliest accounts date even all the way back to ancient Rome, which I find incredible. They're believed to be restless spirits attempting to communicate through noises and moving objects. They're not typically tied to disembodied voices or apparitions. Sometimes they're more playful, like flickering lights or tapping noises, something like that. They're more pranksters, but other times they can get more malicious. They can even set fires or hurl massive objects with incredible force, potentially inflicting physical damage. As well as scratching. That's a, that's a big one, too. Yeah, scratching, yep. One of the most well-known poltergeist case is the Enfield poltergeist, which I know we've covered here on Lights Out, and that was also investigated by the Warrens, and it was the inspiration for the movie Conjuring 2. Yep. Which, whenever I think about that movie, I always think of that scene where the crucifixes on the walls yeah, turn upside, flip upside down. down. It's such a cool scene. Yeah, there's a lot of theories around poltergeists and some people speculate that poltergeists operate in phases and that they start out with just banging, scratching, things like that. But then as the people that are experiencing it become more fearful, it almost feeds off of that fear and is able to become more and more powerful. So the more fear it generates, I guess, the more powerful that entity becomes and they can get powerful enough to the point where they can create mist like apparitions uh, they can even cause physical harm like scratching which uh, my brother's actually experienced physical scratching from oh i remember that previous, story. Yeah, yeah yeah he woke up with big scratches along his side and almost on his back and this was at my previous house where we had some strange activity there. We had knocking on the windows and things like that. And there was just no explanation for it. We check cameras and stuff and there's nobody. I mean, there was nobody around. I, I had some acreage around me. So when it wasn't like just kids running around knocking. So it was just strange things like that. That's wild. Yeah. I know one of the other theories is that it's like psychokinesis to some degree that there's psychic energy, which um, Ed Warren will later touch on a little bit, but yeah, that it can even manifest in a, 
a living person as well that can kind of operate to a certain degree that that maybe it's the energy of the spirit but that it's moving through someone yeah which is pretty wild. that's when things get get crazy but on april fool's day 1974 the family noticed loud thumping noises on the roof only a few at first almost like the beginning of a hailstorm but then the pounding grew more violent and frequently louder and louder as they looked out the window they realized it wasn't hail at all it was black rocks the size of golf balls pelting the rooftop some of the rocks lodged themselves in the damaged roof. Others fell to the ground and immediately vanished. The family thought it might have been a strange April Fool's prank, but even a nearby police officer witnessed the phenomena. The rocks would appear about 20 feet above the house and fall in a zigzag formation before impact. Neither he nor the family had seen anything like it. It literally defied the laws of gravity. And they couldn't understand where the rocks were coming from. After it finally stopped, the police told the family to reach out to a priest for help. Ted took his advice and got a local priest to visit the home a few days later. This was the only moment the family wished there was more activity so they could prove their concerns to this priest. But the whole time the priest was present, all of the activity had stopped, and it just made the Donovan family look crazy. After the awkward visit, the priest's only guess was that someone in the house might be disturbed and advised them to seek professional help. Right after the priest left, the scratching and pounding noises returned. But this time, they weren't contained in the house's interior walls. The family now heard them on the roof, on the windows, and along the outside walls of the house. The disturbance seemed to be growing with no end in sight. And after sundown, the banging only got louder and more violent. After a few days, Ted returned to work with bloodshot eyes and no sleep. He explained to his supervisor why he had been missing so much work. And instead of thinking Ted was a lunatic and just making shit up, his supervisor took the haunting seriously. And that's when he mentioned the names of Ed and Lorraine Warren. But Ted had never heard of them before. He probably had never heard of them before because their career was just taking off at this moment. It was post-Exorcist, uh, the movie. So all these things started coming to fruition and a lot of people just in the cultural zeitgeist, it was now becoming a bigger thing. Um, and Ed and Lorraine Warren would soon become a household name in a matter of years. We've covered them plenty of times on this podcast, but if you're a new listener, Ed was a famous demonologist and Lorraine was a clairvoyant and a medium. And I think famously, she was also a skeptic long before they started investigating these things. And they worked together for about 50 years. And over their career, they claimed to have investigated over 10,000 cases, which is a ton. And what surprised me is that they never charged anyone to investigate any of their cases. They only made money. They, they still had a very successful career, but they mostly made money by giving college lectures or uh, licensing their stories out to films and books and stuff like that. They also had that TV show um, with their son-in-law for a little bit. Yeah. Um, so that's how they made a lot. But yeah, they never charged one cent for their cases, which is wild. No. and and. They're obviously very controversial figures. Like yeah. a lot of people believe that they're just charlatans and, you know, basically snake oil salesmen and there's nothing real about anything that they did and they made it all up. But I, I would argue that just because there's not like this overwhelming abundance of physical evidence, that doesn't mean that they're complete frauds, right? Like obviously you gotta take it with a grain of salt of whether or not you believe what they're what they're saying is true, but most people who go this route do it for the money and obviously like the conjuring franchise is has made over a billion dollars for warner brothers yeah but i don't think the warrens have gotten a huge piece of that because they were they've been brought in as consultants on it and i mean maybe there's some licensing that went on but again that happened way later i mean the first conjuring movie didn't come out to like 2013 or something right yeah. like way later and, and then Ed, Ed had already passed away by then too. Right, yeah, right. It was just Lorraine at that point. Yeah. And then there's obviously the Amityville Horror, which there was two movies on that, or yep. maybe three now. And I, they definitely got paid off of that. But it's like they really became famous because of the work that they did. Yeah, they started doing it almost as a charity. Yeah, and then they became really successful. But I. That's how I, I don't know, you know, I'm more skeptical than you, but 
that's also when I look at them, it's, it's, it's hard not to be more skeptical when someone's making a living off of this. But yeah, like you said, take it with a grain of salt. Any, any good skeptic uh, is, is probably a better paranormal analyzer than, than not. So I, I wouldn't believe them just to a T on everything they say, but I mean, they've definitely experienced quite a lot. I don't think years. you can just say straight up that they're completely fake or frauds. Right, I just yeah. don't think there's a way to 100% support that with evidence. I mean, I can see why one might think that because obviously there's books that they wrote which they made money off the books, but not that much money. It's not like these books are all New York Times bestsellers and things right, like that. Yeah. There's a lot of people that make way more money off of books from their experiences than, than these guys did. Yeah, I was just going to bring up like nonfiction. If you say that they're embellishing things, well, so do your favorite nonfiction writers, right? Everyone yeah. embellishes the stories to, to a sell bit, more but, books. I mean, yeah. it's ultimately about s selling the book. Somebody wants to read a boring book. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so there's that. And then... I think the biggest thing though for the Warrens, and even this is where I'm like, why not share more knowledge of of these cases? If they truly investigated 10,000 cases, why not release your findings? Especially now that they're deceased, why not release all Everything. those findings and, and allow somebody to kind of pick up where they left off and and continue running with, with the investigations? Because if they truly did 10,000 cases and they swear up and down that they recorded a lot of the things that happened in those cases, but yep. yet the public hasn't seen any of it. Yep. And maybe that's just because they're protecting it and protecting their name and their reputation. And, and I think that's a big part of it is they, they want it to kind of remain within the family, so to speak. And they obviously have their haunted museum or their occult museum as well. Yep. Um, but again, I think people are skeptical because it's like, Oh, you guys did all these cases. You guys record all this evidence. Where is it? How come we can't see it? Right. That, I mean, that'd be cool to see. I agree. I would yeah. love to see. Cause even Daniel and I kind of smelled a little bit of BS when in that video we watched, um, Ed in this case in particular, he says, Oh, well we had these news crews come in, but all of the film footage, they erased it. And it's like, well, why? Why would they do that if they're catching? He claims that they were catching things move across. Yeah, so I guess that's my big gripe with them too. It's like, if you guys have all these mounds of evidence, why is there so, there's always like something in the way? There's always a reason yeah. for why we can't see it. Yeah. Yeah. So that, I guess that's something to keep in mind. If you've ever been to the post office, you know just how long it takes to get through that line. And then you end up paying full price for postage before your package is on its way. Thanks to stamps.com, I never have to visit the post office again because I can do everything that the USPS can do for me as well as UPS right from the comfort of my home computer. All you need is a printer, plus stamps.com sends you a free digital scale. So you have all the supplies you need to print your postage 24 seven. You don't have to wait on the hours of the post office. I've been using stamps.com for my businesses for years now absolutely love it. It saved me so much money. I can't even tell you probably ten, twenty thousand $20,000 over the years in postage. That's because stamps.com has huge carrier discounts up to 84% off USPS and UPS rates. Plus stamps.com automatically tells you the cheapest and fastest shipping options. So if you haven't tried stamps.com yet, you need to do it now. If you sign up with my promo code lights out, you'll get a special offer that includes a four week trial plus free postage and a free digital scale. So set your business up or yourself up when you get started with stamps.com today. Sign up with promo code lights out for a special offer that includes a four week trial plus free postage and a free digital scale. And there's no long term commitments or contracts. Just go to stamps.com, click that microphone at the top of the page and enter code lights out. But Ted took down their names and promised himself to reach out eventually but he didn't really know who they were or how they would help. So for now, he and his family would try and solve the problem alone. On the way home, he stopped at a local store and picked up a statue of St. Anne, the mother of the Virgin Mary. When he got home, he unboxed it and set it on a chest in the rec room. Ted thought a religious symbol in the home would ward off bad energy, but it only stirred up more paranormal activity. And when I hear that, I kind of think about us. <laughs> Because I bought this third class relic, <laughs> yeah. which a whole is lot of good totally legit. Yeah. And I feel like things have spiked since this has been in here. Yeah, that's like, very true. So maybe we need to get it out of here because it's just pissing off whatever's in here. Just a thought. Yeah. 
I never thought of that, but you might be on to something. Yeah, because it's like I've, we've had this in here for gosh over a month or so. Yeah, this is from March twenty third, twenty twenty three. Yeah, this thing is signed and dated. Yeah, signed and dated relic. Mm -hmm. This is a legit third class relic. Yeah, or maybe it's just not enough. We need like yeah. a massive, get a bigger one. one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe we do. Right after he set up the statue and then headed towards the living room, he heard a loud crash come from the rec room. He ran to see what had happened, and as he opened the door, he witnessed every piece of furniture suspended in the air. The laundry soap had been uncapped and spewed all over the floor, and the statue of St. Anne had vanished entirely. Ted later found it next to the toilet in the bathroom. From then on, any time he returned the statue to its original place, it would vanish and reappear somewhere else in the house. Which this is something that poltergeists often do. They can make things, essentially teleport objects. I'm actually going to play a clip of Ed Warren talking about objects dematerializing. You know, we're always asked, Ed and I separately, are always asked, what is the most frightening thing you ever experienced in your work? I know what you're going to say. And that's where it happened. About the dematerialization. Tony, if, if that doorway, that door over there can dematerialize in front of me and the molecular structure of it can break down and seconds later Father Bill and the man of the house open the door going down to the basement and the, and the uh, doors are there. If that can happen, it can happen to me. That was but you know, they, the yes. people now are saying she never seen that. That can't happen. Of course, I the molecular seen that. structure of that door can't break down. Well, they performed a test in a poltergeist ridden home. They had cameras set up. They had put these little dolls inside of a, a fish tank, and they covered it over, sealed it tight. The camera actually picked up when one of the dolls suddenly just disappeared and appeared in another part of the room. Mm -hmm. That means that the molecular structure of that doll broke down to the extent it could pass through solid matter like the glass and be teleported to another area. So what she's talking about, we have scientific Have problems. you ever seen personally, Ed, uh, you in a house, we'll say, or Lorraine, besides the door, anything dematerialized and reappear somewhere else that, can you, no, that you can remember? Not, not to that extent, no. I mean, I was, I was right there alone in that. I mean, uh, nobody was there until they yelled the priest but you saw the you saw the door disappear first i heard heavy metal hit a wood floor but there is no wood floors everything is carpeted but that's what you hear tony then i as i looked that was beginning <coughs> to break down all in waves huh. it was breaking down then i i, I you gasp what, what you're looking at you know so they're obviously talking about a different example here, not related to this case. But it is interesting that they claim to have witnessed this experiment being done. Again, it was recorded, and you would think <laughs> that would be a great piece of evidence to prove right. dematerialization. Yeah. I mean, if they, if I could see undoctored video of a door disappearing, count me in as a believer, I would be so convinced. Or if I could just witness it myself, I would be like, Without a doubt, I'd be on board. And this, uh, this is something that happens quite often in paranormal cases is objects, you know, dematerializing and then appearing elsewhere in the home or room or wherever. So it's, it's pretty common. But again, it, that's like a hard thing to capture. I feel like, like, how right. are you going to capture? Cause you don't know where the object's going to end up. Right. right? You, you might be able to see it disappear, but then you can't see it. So how do you know that like cut? Yeah, grab the yeah. object, walk to the other side of the room, and then set it down. And be like roll it, yeah. And it's like there, and you don't know what or when something's going to disappear. Right? It's like the Becker family haunting was his keys were disappearing, and it's like yeah, it would be very hard to capture that happening. Which my rebuttal to the video evidence is like, is it possible that the reason why you know we we think our technology is so good, our cameras are so good, is it possible that our technology the lenses that we have just aren't capable of picking this up like is it yeah. possible it's is it something transdimensional or there's something we haven't yet figured out scientifically that's happening where 
cameras just for whatever reason aren't able to pick it up. I mean, I think it's possible because if you think about whenever I hear dematerializing, I'm thinking of UFOs too specifically because oh, everybody's yeah. always like, oh, how come we can't get any good footage of UFOs? Well, it's like, is it possible that because the it's dematerializing into wherever, whether it's another realm, other dimension, or or maybe it's just the way that it's appearing in the first place. Maybe it's not appearing in a way that our cameras are able to pick it up. Yeah, and I remember when we covered uh, Union Cemetery, yeah. Ed mentioned something where it was like these entities are aware of when they're being photographed. Yeah. So that might also play into it as well. That that's, I mean, that's a great excuse, but you know, it's perhaps still possible. He's I don't think you can completely yeah. like rule out that possibility that we're just not able to pick it up. Yeah. I, I think we're always like, Oh, our technology is so good. Our cameras are so good. Well, yeah, it's good for capturing things that are all physically here, but maybe it's not physically here in the first place or, yeah when it's dematerializing it's just not able you know and if you did have all the gear like who who's just walking along the road and sees something and they can pull out the infrared camera and the temperature meter and like get all these you know not everyone's walking around with that type of stuff anyways so exactly but soon enough all of the furniture in the house began vanishing and then moving across the house patty's turntable and sound system were found smashed to pieces and sections of the walls would tear off and doors flew off of their hinges it was like everything in the house had become animated or possessed. One night, Ellen was alone inside the house for a few hours. Up until now, the family hadn't seen anything that looked like an apparition. But while Ellen was in the living room, she witnessed something she described as a black mist. It had no definite shape, and the shade of black was the deepest she had ever seen. It was like she was staring into a void. But Ellen believed this mist was a manifestation of whatever had been terrorizing their home and this presence made it clear that religious symbols and holy depictions on the walls weren't welcome. As she ran through the house, she noticed that all the pictures of Jesus and the Catholic saints that were once framed had been removed and tossed on the floors. Any time they tried to replace them, it would happen all over again. At one point, curses and blasphemies began showing up on the walls where the religious pictures once hung. This sent Ted into a rage, and instead of directing his anger at the paranormal activity, he stormed into his son's room. He accused Brian of writing the curses on the walls in his bedroom door. He screamed until he brought Brian to tears. But Brian swore to God that he didn't have anything to do with those writings. Later that night, the house stirred with commotion even more than usual. The noises were so loud that Ted decided to move his family into a hotel for the time being. They believed that the activity was tied to the house. But they soon realized that the paranormal energies were actually tied to the family and not the property itself. The banging noises continued even in the hotel room. Neighboring guests got so upset that several complaints came to the front desk. Hotel management knocked on the Donovan's door and gave the family a warning. If they didn't quiet down, hotel security would remove them. Ted promised it wouldn't happen again. And luckily the noises paused for the night. By the next morning, the family had gone to eat the hotel's continental breakfast, and when they returned, they found their whole room trashed. The beds were flipped over and drawers were opened, and their belongings were scattered across the floor. And later that night, the pounding on the walls continued until hotel management actually kicked the Donovan family out. Since they figured the paranormal activity that was plaguing them would follow them, no matter where they went, they decided to just return home. But once they reached the front door, they were afraid to step inside. As bad as the hotel room was, it wasn't nearly as bad as the terrors they had experienced at home. Sure enough, their fears were realized when they found their entire house had been ransacked and torn apart. Broken furniture filled each room and household liquids spilled across the floors and walls. And not a single room was left untouched. A mixed smell of perfume, cologne, shoe polish, and soap floated through the air. They found their bath towels shoved into the toilets and the rugs and carpets had been shredded into pieces. It took them an entire day to clean up the mess. A few days later on Palm Sunday, April 7th, Ted's brother Phil and his family came over to the Donovan's house to go through some old family vacation photos. They ended up setting up a projector screen and cycled through the picture slides. As the slide projector clicked and rotated, the family smiled and laughed as they enjoyed the memories as this was the first time in weeks that they could relax and enjoy themselves. It felt good to finally feel somewhat normal again, but, but this was only the eye of 
the Donovan family storm. As the projector kept rotating the slides, they got to the point of the vacation where they had stopped at a roadside attraction called Holy Land. Meanwhile, Ted was down in the cellar getting something, and in the slide, the family noticed a strange religious insignia in one of the photos. It looked like it had been superimposed on the image. At that exact moment, Ted watched as water began to flow out of the cement wall and flood the cellar. And when he went upstairs and saw the strange insignia on the projector, he took this as a sign. Getting tired of all the strange events, Ted visited the local monastery the next day and talked to one of the monks. He explained his problem and the monk came to visit the house. After a quick examination, the monk told him that he believed the house was possessed by an inhuman spirit. And the monk gave Ted the number to contact Ed and Lorraine Warren. This was the second time someone had mentioned the Warrens to him, so he decided to call. Unfortunately, the Warrens were out west on a speaking tour, but they would return in five days. For Ted and the rest of the family, those five days seemed like an eternity. In between those few days, the Donovans witnessed even more strange activity. The fridge would move to the middle of the kitchen on its own, accompanied by a moan that sounded like it came from the depths of hell. Ted's tools began disappearing so he couldn't repair anything the entity broke. They'd find the household crucifixes turned upside down on the walls. More pictures of saints and religious figures were found shredded, and a box spring mattress flew into a wall that held a picture of Jesus. When Ted finally got a hold of Lorraine, she thought Ted's imagination was just running wild. His story had so much going on that it didn't even sound real at first. But as she talked with him more, she began to believe... Ed and Lorraine showed up to the house that Sunday. When they approached the house, they noticed the front lawn was littered with stones. And once they got inside, they saw that the home was in complete disrepair. It was a beautiful house, but it was covered in stains, and bits of food were plastered across the walls. And no matter how hard the family scrubbed, the walls would never be clean. As Ted gave him the tour, he listed off a dozen paranormal events they had experienced in each room, Lorraine later claimed that she could sense a paranormal presence so powerful inside the house that it took all of her energy not to leave immediately. Sensing so many negative energies in one place even brought her to tears several times. Once the tour was over, she sat the family down and told them it was clear that at least one demonic entity was attacking the family, possibly more. While Ed and Lorraine interviewed the family and asked the usual questions, Ed asked if anyone had recently used a Ouija board. Patty, who had been feeling guilty this whole time, immediately confessed. Lorraine asked her if the entity had ever given her its name, but it never had. After Patty told them everything she knew, Lorraine believed an incubus might have been at work. An incubus is a demon in male form that tries to have sex with women while they sleep. It's also the name of a pretty decent band. In Latin, pretty decent. <laughs> yeah, pretty decent. In Latin, it roughly translates to a nightmare-induced demon, and its earliest known mentions of the demon come from. If you can guess it, where do you think it came from? Mesopotamia. There you go. Circa 2400 BCE. It's Ancient. often, yeah, like many are. It's often believed these demons want to have offspring with sleeping women. And there's actually this crazy legend in Brazil that there's an Amazon river dolphin or the Boto Cor de Rosa, which means pink porpoise. That's part siren and part incubus. I don't know if you remember in uh, Planet Sleep in our Amazon oh, yeah. river, the pink dolphin, right? Yeah. It's very famous in that area. The legend says that this river dolphin can shape shift into a charming, handsome young man, and it goes around town and seduces young women and impregnates them. Some areas called the creature Encantado, which translates to enchanted or charmed. In some areas, a fatherless child might still be called child of the Boto. According to legend, repeated sex with an incubus can lead to failing health, impaired mental state, or even death. Uh, as far as I know, no one in the Donovan family was experiencing sex with a demon. The closest thing was Patty being flattered and seduced by that entity through the Ouija board. Which would make sense why Lorraine might have been leaning that way. Exactly. Based on what Patty was telling her. Yep. Mm. So that's the idea is that even though the incubus wasn't in full form, so to speak, she got the hint that through her communications with the Ouija board, 
that there was maybe something going on. Mm. Later that day, after sunset, Ed and Lorraine stayed in the house to witness the activity firsthand. And as usual, the pounding noises began. When the pounding fell silent, Ed knocked on the walls two times as a test, and two knocks returned. Then he knocked four times, and four knocks came from the kitchen table and the floors. With confirmation that something was indeed off, Ed called a local priest who they called Father Jason and told him to stay at the house of the family overnight while he and Lorraine headed home for a few days. At one point during the night, Father Jason asked for a glass of water, but before anyone could go and get him one, a cup floated across the room and rested right in front of him. He then tested the entity by requesting a pencil, and sure enough, a pencil floated over to him as well. A few days passed and the haunting continued, and by the time the Warrens returned, they noticed Father Jason and the family were completely worn out. For their own protection, they had all slept in the same bedroom besides Father Jason, who had his own room. But none of them got any sleep. The pounding noises had continued through the night even worse than before. When the Warrens checked out the rest of the house, there was so much damage that they were surprised it had fallen in on itself. Over the next few days, they brought in a few members of the news media to capture footage of the events. Ed later claimed that all the footage was later erased, but personally, the Warrens didn't need any more evidence to know there was clearly a serious problem surrounding the Donovan family, so they discussed the possibility of an exorcism of the house. The Warrens were convinced this demonic presence was capable of much more than it had revealed, and if they didn't help the Donovan family as soon as possible, this demon could haunt the family, the Warrens, and Father Jason for the rest of their lives. So their first goal is to gather enough evidence to convince the Catholic Church an exorcism was needed. When they brought up the possibility of an exorcism, Ted could hardly believe that a demon was actually inside of his home. Meanwhile, Ellen had a crisis of faith and wondered why God would allow an entity into their house. Patty was fully on board with the exorcism and completely owned up to the use of the Ouija board. And as for Brian, he was the least invested. But the others could tell the paranormal activity was wearing down his mental health as well. As the Warrens kept investigating, they noticed Patty would have strange outbursts. She'd become hostile and angry for no reason. Ed thought that the reactions might have been from the demon channeling energy through her. And she might have been a vessel that was open to possession. So he told the rest of the family that they all needed to keep an eye on Patty for the next few days. And the Warrens stayed with them. One night, while the family was together in the bedroom, the double bed began shaking and levitating off the floor. An ultra-black figure materialized in front of them and then vanished. Meanwhile, in Brian's room, Lorraine was sitting beside Brian when an invisible force lifted him five feet into the air and threw him across the room. Then Father Jason witnessed rosary beads levitate and float out of his room. When he followed them into the kitchen, he found them wrapped around the arm of a wooden chair. But the beads were still animated and he could hear crunching noises as the beads tightened around the chair, almost like they were simulating a strangulation. After witnessing a threat like this, everyone agreed it was too dangerous to stay inside the house, so Ed told the Donovans to stay at Ted's parents' house for a while. Ted then gave Father Jason and the Warrens a spare key to the house so they could keep investigating. A few days passed and Father Jason returned to his clergy house. He later told Ed that he kept witnessing a dark figure blocking his bedroom door every night. He felt like a prisoner trapped inside his room every time the sun went down. On April 25th, the Warrens visited the house without the Donovans there and Ed stepped inside first. Like always, he found the entire place trashed. Plumbing had been ripped out of the walls and most of the furniture was broken. The entire house reeked and strange fluids were dumped across the walls and floors. Beds were flipped over and rotten food covered the kitchen floor. As he walked through the chaos, he shouted religious provocations, and he threatened the entity that he would get the church involved. This seemed to set the entity off, because as he entered the hallway and walked toward one of the bedrooms, he noticed the entire house began to shake. It was like an earthquake isolated to his exact location. Everything rumbled for a moment and then stopped. Ed scrambled into one of the bedrooms when he noticed an old, feeble man, or something that looked like an old man, standing in the corner. Then strange psychic energy charged the room, violently slicing the walls, curtains, and furniture. As the energy circled the room and approached Ed, he lifted his arms to protect himself and was slashed several times before stumbling back into the hallway. Then he ran back toward the living room. When Lorraine and Father Jason entered the house and found him, he was walking in a daze. 
Ed then noticed that he had two large gashes on his arm, and they were in the shape of a holy cross. Here's the Warrens talking about that wound. It was summertime, and Ed never wears long sleeves in the summer, as you well know. But all that time, he wore, he wore long sleeves. And the only one that he allowed to look at that cross, the only thing he kept using on it was holy water, by the way. And the only one he showed it to was Father Charbonneau. He didn't show it to anybody else. What are, this, are these really, gou really gouges or, or scratches? What, what do they look like? It feels like? like a burn. When I held my arm up like this, it felt just like a burn. Uh, then I could see it was a cut. It was a psychic slash. His actual bleeding. cut. Yeah, it was oh, yeah. all over him. With blood. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. It was all How blood. long did that last before it went away? Tell oh, it lasted about three days. That's, that's right. That's I, all. I, I never put anything antiseptic on it or nothing. I just used holy water. And when it disappeared, there was no scar, no nothing. No. Because I understood what was happening. How many times have you had that happen to you? Oh, God. Many? Blown across the rooms, uh, knocked down stairs, punched in the face. Arm twisted up in back of me. I got to tell you that it must be at least two, three dozen times things happen like that to me. Imagine getting punched in the face by a Damn. spirit, right? God, Ed's, Ed's been to, to battle. And I think he's targeted more because he's the one that does the religious the provocations. provocations. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. Fearing more attacks, they abandoned the house. And while they bandaged Ed's wounds out in the car, they agreed that the future confrontations could be fatal. Ed promised he would no longer shut out religious provocations. A few days went by and the Warrens contacted the Donovans. They said that they had good news and told them that they had presented the evidence to the church and the church had approved and scheduled an official exorcism on Thursday, May 2nd. They also returned to the house where they barely recognized the inside. Again, almost everything had been shifted or destroyed. It was a husk of what their home had once been. Ed and Lorraine then helped the family clean up the place for the next several hours and agreed to stay with the family until the exorcism. Once they had things back in order, it raised the family's spirits. It felt nice being back in their home, even though so much of it had been destroyed. But they feared that another attack was inevitable, and all their hard work would soon be undone. It didn't take long for their fears to come true. The paranormal activity grew even worse within the few days before the exorcism was to take place. Metal photo frames would suddenly burn with a bright glow and crash to the floor. Scarves and towels would burn at scorching hot temperatures and fling themselves at the family members, covering them in scalding wounds. On the night before the exorcism, around 10.30 p.m., a bright light appeared in the living room doorway in front of everyone. They saw the figure of an elderly woman materialize within the light, but she was only visible from the waist up. After a moment, she began to speak, and she promised that if they came with her, they would be saved. Lorraine sensed danger and told everyone to back away from the entity. Then two kitchen chairs flew toward Ed and pinned him against the wall. But Ed managed to make the sign of the cross, and the chairs fell to the floor. The old woman then vanished, and the light faded away. The rest of the night was mostly quiet, and the exorcist Father Charbonneau arrived at 9.30 the next morning. The Donovans, Father Jason, and the Warrens all attended the ritual. Ed had worked with Father Charbonneau before, and he explained they believed they were dealing with a possible demon or devil, a few lesser inhuman spirits, and possibly an incubus. Before beginning the ritual, Father Charbonneau blessed everyone present. And then he confronted Patty, who he saw as the source of the problem. He asked her if she intentionally willed this evil presence upon her family, but she was offended by the question and snapped at him. She didn't intend for any of this to happen. Then he told her she needed to ask God for forgiveness, and she quietly agreed. Father Charbonneau then began the exorcism in the living room, and about halfway through a series of prayers, the room temperature dropped to freezing, and Ellen was the first to notice a figure near the fireplace. It looked like a classic demon with horns on its head, cloven feet, claws on its hands, and a tail. Father Charbonneau took his vial of holy water and splashed some on the demon, which caused it to vanish for a moment. When it reappeared, it took a different form. The demon's face then materialized into the carpet beneath them. It looked like it was made of ashes, and it grimaced and glared at each of them. Let's hear from Lorraine about what she saw. 
But you brought Beautiful. a priest in. You brought in Father Charbonneau. Yeah, and there was another priest what did, working by and proxy. Another priest, what, did he, what did he have to do in that he house? He performed what, an exorcism. <clears throat> what, tell me about that. <clears throat> what was that? He performed an exorcism in the living room of that house. Was he exorcising the house, Ed? The yeah. father, the priest? Yeah. yeah. Or was but he exorcising the, house was the people, too? Infested. Well, he blessed everybody. He even didn't the perform door. an exorcism on the people. He because they weren't possessed. He blessed them. No. But he was performing an exorcism in the house. And we were there. See, we try to be part of every exorcism that, that's performed like this, Tony, because we've been involved. How long did the exorcism take? It took a good part of the morning. And on the floor, they had all very light color carpeting, which, by the way, was totally ruined. And hmm. your stereotype devil head with horns formed. And what it looked like, the substance that it used, the medium that it used, was like ashes. That's what it looked like. Dark, dark ashes. Was there a Father Jason in there? Father, was there, what, what they called him, Father Jason? They called him Father Jason. Because it says Father Jason was affected in a rather more sinister and ominous way. For the past two weeks, he had witnessed the most incredible phenomena caused by the demonic. This theological devil had taken on real proportions, and he truly felt in danger. Mm -hmm. Indeed, a spirit from the Donovan house had followed him, too. You mean something followed the priest? Yes. Oh, yeah. Father Bill was affected a great deal a great deal by his work. Again, Father Charbonneau shot the holy water at the figure and it vanished. A pink outline was left behind on the floor. As the ceremony continued, Father Charbonneau said he could sense the presence leaving the home and that the departure was near. And with one final prayer, the exorcism came to an end. According to the Warrens and the family, from that day on, they never witnessed another paranormal event again, but the Donovan family was permanently scarred forever. The Donovan's true identities, as well as the property address, have never been released, and the Warrens swore the information to secrecy. Brian later went off to college, and Patty went on to marry and have three children, just like the entity had predicted. And as far as we know, the Donovan family still lives at the house in West Hartford, Connecticut to this day. Their story lives on as one of the most chaotic paranormal experiences that the Warrens have ever experienced. Wow. So, let's digest this for a moment. Yeah. If this all indeed happened the way that it did, why would any family in their right mind attempt to hoax this? What would be the benefit for them? Right. They're literally trashing their house? For what? And they stayed anonymous, which it like yeah, that that shows that like they're not trying to profit yeah, or yeah. or become famous from this phenomenon. So again, because it's anonymous, we have no way to verify the right. That's the tricky part. Yeah, that they're real. But I understand because after the Becker haunting one, remember he was like, "I'm sick of the pro paparazzi saying all this, or I'm sick of the tabloids saying all these weird things about the house that didn't happen." I'm tired of them contacting me, et cetera. So I, I get why people want to be anonymous. When well, it's like, things happen. I think the main thing is they didn't want their like family to be affected by the media going forward. Right? right. Or be exploited or, you know, put some type of negative stereotype on them, you know, cause I mean, you want to go on and live your life. Once you've experienced this, you want to be able to hopefully go back to living a normal, happy life and not have this like looming over your head or, people coming up to you and at, you know antagonizing you and trying to like get information from you so i get it from that perspective of like maybe it's that's really the best way forward is to just kind of remain anonymous in this case and just go on living your life yeah and so with every warren file it really comes down to what you believe many of you out there think it's all hoax it's all fake they just made it up to sell books or media or whatever attention but that but at the end of the day like we really only know about the story basically from through them through yeah. them and this is like the only video on uh, on youtube at least of the story really yeah. I and mean, there's not a whole lot of information out there from it other than from the warns themselves yeah and i i don't think father charbonneau is still around but i would love to see if he ever 
spoke about any of these things because even father jason too yeah true which i think he also went by a fake name because they kept calling him father bill yeah so i wasn't sure who that was exactly but i i wonder if either of them has has ever talked about it publicly um i'd love to get their take on even just like a a a third party to the warrens and what they thought of them and stuff because i know father charbonneau had worked with ed before but it's interesting because like in modern times it seems like a lot of priests are very like adverse to talking about exorcisms or demonic possession or anything i think there's more taboo now than it was in the 70s because there was like this just massive cultural shift where i think now too many terrible things have happened in exorcisms you know like the where people have died or where it wasn't actually somebody that's mentally ill that's sort of being exploited in a way to and to i guess use it as evidence for the paranormal being real or demonic possession being real yeah it's really hard to say i mean it's you could take it either way i mean i tend to i know some people give me like oh josh you believe in everything and i'm like (laughs) well no i don't believe in everything i definitely I'm skeptical of, of certain stories because some are just so blatantly hoaxes. It's not even funny. Like yeah. it's, it's very obvious that they were doing it and there was a motive for doing it. I think you have to think about what's the motive for, for faking a, a paranormal, you know, infestation. I think that's one thing you got to think about, but I want to know from Daniel because Daniel is very skeptical when it comes to the paranormal. What do you, what do you think of this? Do you think there's any validity to this, this case? So unfortunately with the lack of, you know, you're going to go to the lack of evidence with the, with the lack of evidence. It does make it hard to sure. believe that this is a real case. But when it comes to Ed and Lorraine Warren, whether or not you believe in that they're telling the truth and what they're doing is true, they are having people that need help reaching out to them and they are helping them for free. And they're even trying to keep them anonymous to avoid any media uh, swarms on them. So I have to admit they're not doing anything wrong. Yeah. No, no. And I think the other part of this too is when talking about the Warrens, they are, they are coming at this from a a religious perspective. Like they're they're both Catholic. Exactly. So it's like, I mean, demonologist is not a, there's not like a real legit study of demons. You know what I mean? It's not like a, you don't get certified or anything. Not really. No, I mean, there's some institutes that do certificates, things like that along those lines, but it's not like in academia, there's like, a degree you get yeah i got a bachelor's i mean degree maybe in, in some theology. seminary schools there's probably you know niche courses on, on this type of thing of of dealing with demons i mean you can go on amazon and find tons of books on on yeah. demons and how to deal with demonic possessions and but again demons are strictly tied to the biblical definition right like it, it comes back to the bible ultimately i mean that's where demons you know, originate in this, in this form. Right. And I mean, incubus goes back to other, other religions and things like that. And we have covered a uh, demonology episode covering demons from all cultures. So it, it does seem like it is a name put on perhaps a larger, larger form of phenomena that just isn't fully explained. Cause I mean, it's like in this particular case, was it, you know, a demon from hell or a manifestation of, of something from hell, or is this a poltergeist, some just type of evil spirit that they attempted to identify? Cause that's like something I always try to do is identify what, what is actually possessing or haunting a particular house or location. And so they're pulling from their own experience and their own education. And it stems from Catholicism, but we do find similar experiences in, other cultures around the world and other religions so it's like you have to keep that in mind it's like this is just their how they made sense of this right Right. but it doesn't necessarily mean it's the right identification that's going on like it could just be their what they experience over time and this is just what they you know the name they put to it but really it could be something completely unidentified just something completely unknown like yeah. we just don't know what it is yeah I feel and like that's kind of how i look at it is like i don't necessarily believe it's something you know it depends on if you believe in in the bible and, and all these things and i think there's some some truth of, that lies within the bible but it's like i don't necessarily attach myself to 
this one way of thinking. I think a lot of it just stems from something unexplained is going on. There's something unknown. There is, there's clearly some other realm there's or, or dimension or something going on where something is, is affecting the physical reality that we all experience. And ultimately we're all trying to figure out what it is. Yeah. And, and I, leave I, it at that. Like we just don't know. Yeah. And I, we brought that up um, a few episodes ago where I like that idea of that. It's not, as much as we try to narrow down a poltergeist or an incubus, as, as much as we try and boil those things down and think that they're happening from house to house in all these cases, they're most likely they're just these unexplained things that you really can't just write down in a notebook and identify like, oh, this, this checks all the boxes of a poltergeist, so that's what it is, and that's what we know what we're dealing with. I think, yeah, it's much more complex than that, if, if this is real. I always, just for the sake of you know, discussion. I always like to look between when I'm researching these, I like to look between the lines and try and figure out what's actually going on with the family because not we, for probably more reasons than we would like to admit, there's probably more going on beneath the surface of a sure. family dynamic. And so I always try and figure out, okay, what's happening because we don't always get that in the paranormal cases. We get what's happening on the paranormal end of things, but we don't always get the family dynamic. So when I think of the father bringing his son to tears in an accusation, I think, wow, what else is going on within that point, relationship yeah. that, that might be adding to this story? Or maybe they're, they're, you know, they've covered up these certain things of the family relationship that we're not getting. Yeah, th that's a good point because we don't really know the yeah, family but, at all. Yeah. I mean, we don't even know anonymous. their names. So yeah, right. For all we know, this could be a family that has a, a ton of turmoil within it. And right. perhaps Brian is the one destroying the house out of anger or yeah. just in retribution towards his, his parents. And perhaps Patty's in on it too. And Patty's playing with the Ouija board and is trying to go against maybe what her parents are telling her um, around the Ouija board. Cause I mean, a lot of parents are like, don't, you know, especially if your parents have a religious background, they're like, absolutely no case whatsoever do you play with a ouija board so maybe it was in an act of spite. rebellion yeah an yeah. act of rebellion i mean that could absolutely be the case although i think there's a lot of things within this that are it'd be pretty extreme for two essentially kids to, to do all this tires six times yeah you either have I mean, something seriously wrong Jesus, or, like, yeah. That's a lot of anger and then the stones is a weird thing yeah like, the stones is a weird one i, I and like it did happen on April Fool's Day, so I could think, <laughs> but how would you even orchestrate well, then, that? I mean, and then there's this police officer that, that witnesses this. Yeah, like, right. Well, shit, I'd love to hear from him, too. Yeah, right. What did he see? Yeah. I love how his gut instinct was like, find a priest. Yeah. I don't know what's going on here, but. And again, it's like, in the Warren stories, it's like, all roads lead to them. Yeah, yeah. So that, I get it. It's like, it's hard, because you're like. Uh, uh, conveniently all leads back to them and they're the heroes at the end of the day. They are the heroes. They're always yeah. the heroes in these stories. Yeah. Like they come in, they identify what the hell's going on and then they, they have the connections to the, the right people to, to bring in. Right. And yeah. I know, I think there's even some controversy on like uh, the Catholic church and their relationship with the Warrens and like there is no, you know, relationship there. Right. And they're not like sanctioned by the Catholic church at all. So it's, it's kind of this big question mark of how do they, how are they able to pull off like a Vatican approved yeah, exorcist exactly. to That's come in crazy. and yeah. perform an exorcism on the home? I mean, that seems like pretty serious. That's a, I mean, we all know the the Catholic church and the Vatican. I mean, there's a serious hierarchy there and structure there. And it's like, Hmm, maybe they, back in the seventies, it was yeah. a little more fast and loose, but, and I think that's, that's what's interesting too, is like a lot of this occurs like between 1960 and like the early nineties. Yeah. And there's just not a lot of, of these types of stories that occur in the 2000s. Now, yeah. Or in like the last 20 years, it's like how many stories are out there like this? Yeah, and I don't know anyone to the status of the Warrens that are operating today. Like where are, where's our millennial Ed and Lorraine Warren, you know? And I think people would argue like, oh, like Zach Bagans and Ghost oh, Adventures, yeah, yeah. you know what I mean? Like yeah. he would, in my mind he would be the closest to this type of individual who's because he kind of carries that legacy on in a lot of ways yeah. i mean he's got his haunted museum he he goes into the most haunted locations on the planet and he conducts investigations and yeah they do 
I think they do they do capture some stuff that's legit and is like hmm, head scratcher. Like what's going on there? I've heard uh, accounts. I think it's on Reddit. So take this with a grain of salt. But I've heard people working on shows like that that they're like maybe one time right. out of an entire episode will actually catch something that is a head scratcher. The rest is a little fabricated. But even the fact that they would admit that it's one time is pretty crazy. You would expect like someone, if they're going to whistle blow on a show like that, they'd be like, it's all BS. But I remember reading this one guy's testament. He's like, I worked on the show for a few months. And he's like, every once in a while, we'd actually come across some weird shit. And that's, and that's the hard part is like a lot of people are, it's like all or nothing with people. Yeah. They like yeah. want it all to be real or it's all fake and all, yeah. all just, you know, for TV. And like, if you know anything about the world of TV and TV shows, it's like everything is embellished. Like they're trying, ultimately there's a goal behind it to Gotta make that money, make that money, make it interesting from start to finish. So a lot of times members of the crew will be like, Oh, I just felt this or, you know, it's things that can't be measured, can't really be captured. You're just seeing reactions of people. I mean, even YouTubers, I mean, there's tons of YouTubers that have whole channels where they just, all they do is they go around to haunted sites and, and take footage and stay overnight. And, and it's the same kind of thing. Like every now and then they'll caption like, Oh, that was weird. Unexplainable. Something moved or something like that. But it's like, a two hour episode where like one thing happens right, or one something. thing yeah. happens and then the, and and that's where i come back to is it is it because these entities or or paranormal forces know they're we're trying to film and we're trying to capture them in order to exploit them or to you know profit off of them in some way and therefore they they shut it down because it seems like a lot of it happens when cameras aren't rolling and yeah, then it just becomes yeah comes down to like whether or not you believe the individual if you know are they having a legitimate experience or not and that's that's the hard part but also the fun part of the paranormal is like it just comes down to how much you believe in the paranormal as a whole in this whole idea of uh, another spiritual realm existing or spirits being evil versus good and and all of that at the end of the day and it's just a personal thing i think yeah so everybody's definitely. got their own personal opinions on it and just leave it at that you know and yeah. then and then obviously if you experience your own stuff like that's why my own personal experiences by far outweigh any story i've covered or any case i've i've looked into as far as believing in hauntings or or um cursed objects or any of any of the of the sort being real I'd say my own experiences and the only things I've seen with my own eyes and things that have happened in my studios and to people that I know, it's all weird. Like I can't put it, I can't identify what it is. I can't, I'm like, that was a poltergeist. That right, was an incubus. Yeah, yeah. That was a straight up demon from hell. That was like one of Satan's legions. Like, yeah. You know what I, I mean? Well, that's why I'm just like so desperate for something to happen. If anything is listening, I'm, I want to experience Well, that's where people it. like, boys get the ouija board out yeah, yeah. <laughs> and let's let's do it let's do it and i keep coming back to that and I'm, I'm continuing to debate on it because it's like every story where shit gets absolutely out of hand comes back to the ouija board oh yeah always the ouija board so it's like damn i'm ready i'm ready you're ready i'm ready i know I'm, daniel's ready I'm too bitter. ready <laughs> all right well maybe we'll have to put that on on, on the calendar for sometime this year but that is going to be it for us today. Let us know your thoughts on the Donovan Poltergeist case. Do you believe it or do you think it's just a bunch of BS? Let us know in the comments below if you're watching on YouTube. As always, make sure you're following us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts. It really does help us out. Thank you for joining us. It's always fun to, to cover the paranormal. We'll be back next week with another one. Until then, lights out, everybody. <laughs>